Okay, well, welcome everyone. My name is Jennifer Boyko, and I'm the Senior Manager of Scientific Operations for the Canadian Longitudinal Study on Aging, or CLSA for short. Thanks for joining us for the CLSA webinar today, entitled Casting Light on the Genetics of Age-Related Hearing Loss, Insights from the Canadian Longitudinal Study on Aging. I'd like to begin by first acknowledging that the CLSA's National Coordinating Centre and McMaster University are located on the traditional territories of the Mississauga and Haudenosaunee nations and within the lands protected by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Agreement. And the University of Manitoba campuses are located on original lands of the Anisha, Anishinaabe, uh, the Ani in Inawak. Um, these are new, new, new ones for me, and also the Ansinan Nuwak, Dakota, Ayote, and Dene, and on the national homeland of the Red River Métis. As attendees of this webinar, I encourage you to continue your learning following the webinar and to also acknowledge the original inhabitants of the lands where we currently have the privilege to do research, live and work, wherever that may be for you. Now let's review a couple housekeeping points that are standard to all of our webinars. Uh, everyone but the presenters will be muted throughout the webinar today. If you need to change or test your audio during the webinar, you can click on audio settings on the bottom of the Zoom window. Um, at the end of today's presentation, there will be a question and answer session. If you have a question for the presenter during the webinar, you can post it in the Q&A box that will be at the bottom of your screen. Um, or at the bottom of your toolbar. Uh, the questions will be addressed at the very end of the webinar and um, also note that questions will be vis visible to all the attendees. If you have any tro technical trouble at all during the webinar, you can use the chat box to communicate with our webinar team and that's usually on the side um, of your uh, screen. Uh, finally, a feedback survey will be launched at the end of the webinar, and we would like to invite you to complete it after exiting this Zoom session today. Uh, the brief survey does provide us important feedback that we can use to plan future webinars like these ones. So again, today's webinar, entitled Casting Light on the Genetics of Age-Related Hearing Loss, Insights from the Canadian Longitudinal Study on Aging is being presented by Dr. Britt Drogmuller of University of Manitoba. Uh, Dr. Drogmuller is an assistant professor in the Max Brady College of Medicine at the University of Manitoba. Her research focuses on using large-scale genomic and computational analyses to understand the genetics underlying hearing traits, such as age-related hearing loss. So now I will turn it over to you. Thank you. Great, thank you so much for that uh, nice introduction. I'm just gonna share my slide. Um, does everything look good on your side? Uh, awesome. So yeah, th thank you. Thank you so much for the opportunity to pre present to you today about some of the research we've been doing and um, using the CLSA data to try and understand a little bit behind the genetics of age-related hearing loss. Um, so, so just to give you a bit of context into the burden of hearing loss, um, according to the World Health Organization World Report on Hearing, um, currently one in five people worldwide experience uh, hearing loss, and these numbers are expected to increase with, um, by the time we get to 2050, it's estimated that um, approximately one in four people are projected to have problems with their hearing. Um, so, so this is a significant burden and hearing loss does place a large burden on older adults specifically. Um, so hearing loss is the most common sensory impairment in older people, um, specifically in the Canadian context. 65% of Canadians who are older than 70 years um, experience hearing loss. And of course, hearing loss can come with additional considerations. So with hearing loss, can you can have an increase in communication difficulties. Um, 
increase in communication difficulties can really lead to social isolation, which in turn can lead to depression. So there are a number of factors that contribute to increased risk of hearing loss. Um, this includes things like uh, continuous exposure to noise, um, exposure to autotoxic drugs, or just the natural process of aging. While these factors do play an extremely important role in hearing loss, we also know that genetics is an important contributor. Um, so some of the most convincing evidence uh, for the role of genetics in hearing phenotypes comes from the fact that we know that when you have genetic variants that um, affect the functioning of very specific genes that play important roles in the functioning of specific cells in the, the ear. Uh, so I have a picture of the hair with these beautiful cells that uh, you can find in the inner ear, um, as well as some genes that we know are important to the functioning of these, these cells. So the, the really the, the evidence for genetics comes from the fact that we know if you have genetic variants in some of these genes, this can result in inherited hearing impairment. However, the majority of hearing loss phenotypes that we see can't, can't be explained by a single genetic variant. Um, the majority of these traits are in fact polygenic in nature, which means that there are tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands of genetic variants or changes in the DNA sequence that all act together um, to slightly increase or slightly decrease your risk of hearing loss. So in order to really get a good picture of each of these genetic variants, um, we need to think of specific ways to do this. It's not, not as simple as looking at a specific family and looking for variants that occur only in individuals who have hearing loss. And this, this is really the, the question my lab and, and lots of other labs um, around the world are trying to ask, how can we identify these genetic variants that contribute to hearing loss? So the way the field of human genetics has approached looking at complex traits like um, age-related hearing loss and how genetics contributes to these traits is to use something called genome-wide association studies. So essentially what these studies do is they look at millions of genetic variants or changes in DNA sequence that occur across the whole human genome and they essentially compare the frequency of these genetic variants in individuals who have hearing loss to those that don't have hearing loss. And so in doing this, we can identify genetic variants that are more likely to occur in individuals who have hearing loss. Um, and this is, this is exactly what people have been doing. Um, there are other large scale databases like the UK uh, Biobank where there's information on hearing loss phenotypes and genetic variation for around 300,000 individuals. And so people have looked at um, reported hearing difficulty and they've identified genetic variants that are associated with hearing difficulty. Um, so what, what this figure shows over here on my slide is each little dot represents a specific region in the genome where there's a change in DNA sequence. And that genetic variant is plotted by where it occurs on the human genome. So we have 22 chromosomes. So you can see here uh, chromosomes 1 to 22 at the bottom. Um, this is also plotted by the log of the p-value, which is a measure of how significantly different these variants are in individuals who have hearing loss and those who don't. Um, so you can see over here in this plot, any, any dot that occurs above this red dotted line is significantly associated with hearing loss. And you can see there are, there are a number of different regions in the genome that were found to be associated. So I think the, the most significant one here is a gene called ARHGF28. However, the, the major limitation with these studies is that they have 
largely relied on essentially self-reported hearing difficulty. So asking individuals who participated in the study, they asked them, do you experience difficulties hearing? And people will answer yes or no. So there are a number of limitations with self-report. People perceive things differently. So someone who may have hearing loss may perceive that they don't have hearing loss or vice versa. In addition to this, um, there aren't any large scale um, studies looking at genetic variants that contribute to specific hearing phenotypes. And, and this is important because there are diverse pathologies implicated in different hearing phenotypes, like some hearing loss is caused by noise, some hearing loss is caused by aging. So they're really just lumping these, these phenotypes into one category of yes or no is, is not necessarily the most accurate way of looking at this phenotype. Um, so yeah. If, if we take a look, so I just have a little picture of the, the inner ear and the, the structure, this little snail structure is the cochlea. So if we take a zoomed in look at a cross section of this region, um, we see that there are all these lots of different, I think I, I mentioned this at the beginning of the presentation, but there are lots of different cells that are all really important and re really complex and, and play a role in hearing in different ways. Um, so what other researchers have found is that depending on the type of hearing loss that you see, there are certain parts of the cochlea or certain cells that are more likely to get affected. So for example, when you see something like hearing loss that's, that's typical of more like an age-related phenotype or a metabolic phenotype, um, we see... Uh, degeneration of cells in the structure called the stria vascularis. Um, in comparison, if we look at something like hearing loss caused by um, exposure to noise or extensive exposure to noise over time, um, we see that the cells that are affected are more likely to be uh, related to the hair cells in the inner ear. Um, so you can see that there are different processes involved in these different um, uh, hearing phenotypes. Um, so something like self-reported hearing loss might not capture those subtle differences. However, there are tools that can be used to really capture this in a more comprehensive way. And, and this, this can be captured through something called audiograms. Um, so for those of you who aren't necessarily familiar with audiograms, I'm just going to briefly explain um, what these, these graphs are. So what audiograms do is they measure the softest sounds that individuals can hear at different frequencies. So if you think about um, frequencies on a, on a piano, it can range from a, a low frequency to a higher frequency. Um, uh, so, so when you look at an audiogram, an individual will, will get exposed to a specific uh, frequency of sound and they'll play that sound at that frequency very softly, and then they'll play it louder and louder and louder until the person says they can hear it. And then you'll plot that uh, point on the graph, which is the softest sound that they can hear at that frequency. And then you'll repeat this at a slightly higher frequency, and again, higher, 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 until you have a graph of the softest sounds that you can hear at these different frequencies. Um, so what's really nice about these audiograms is that you can look at the shape of the audiograms to get a good indication of the type of hearing loss that is observed in an individual. So for example, I, I was talking about um, this uh, more age-related hearing loss phenotype where we see that the, the stria vascularis is typically affected. Um, when we look at this type of hearing loss, we see that the audiogram that corresponds to this type of hearing loss shows this, this sort of gradual sloping shape. So as the frequencies that the individual is exposed to get uh, progressively higher, it becomes more and more difficult to hear those frequencies, but there's a, there's a very gradual change 
in the ability to hear those frequencies. And that's where this, this gradual slope uh, becomes evident. Um, in contrast, if we look at something like uh, hearing loss, it's more typical of noise exposure or exposure to autotoxic drugs. What we see is that um, individuals can hear uh, pretty normally at, um, I just, just checking my, yeah. Um, they can hear pretty normally at the, the lower frequencies. So it's, it's fairly easy to hear sounds that are played at these frequencies, but as those, those frequencies become higher, it becomes much harder to hear. So you see this, this sort of steep sloping shape in the, the audiogram. So normal hearing, and then a, a pretty quick loss of hearing at higher frequencies. Um, so this is this is really um, nice because it means that we can use these audiograms to phenotype hearing more accurately when compared to self-reported hearing loss. Um, however, you can imagine we've got these these large scale databases like the CLSA where you have tens of thousands of individuals who have audiogram measurements taken. Um, so you can imagine if you have to look at each of these audiograms manually, um, ideally you would have two people independently looking at them and trying to say this one, this one looks like it's more of a gradual slope and this one looks like it's more of a steep slope and, it, and it's not always so clear cut. So you can imagine trying to do this would just take um, a really long time to really get those precise phenotypes. Um, and I, I've been involved in a study before where we did actually, we had two audiologists independently looking at a couple of hundred of these and it, it took years, honestly, to uh, look at these different shapes and sometimes they're disagreements and you need to get an, an, another person in to sort of resolve the disagreements. So it can be really challenging. So, the solution to this is to try and use an automated phenotyping strategy. So we can we can get these audiograms, use an automated strategy and essentially classify without having to manually look at audiograms. Um, and so this is a project that uh, a really fantastic PhD student in my lab, Sima Ahmed, has been leading. Um, and I, I also need to acknowledge not only has she been leading the study, a lot of the the, the probably better slides in my presentation uh, she created and kindly has allowed me to use these slides. So um, yeah, I just wanted to take a moment to acknowledge uh, Samar's work. Um, so yeah, so some, what Samar has done is she has tried to find an automated phenotyping strategy so she can classify hearing loss into uh, these different types and then use these phenotypes to identify genetic variants that are associated with these specific hearing loss phenotypes. Um, so right when we were starting the study, um, we saw a couple of papers published by a group at the Medical University of South Carolina. Um, and so we reached out to Dr. Judy Dubner and Kenneth Faden and at that moment, they were just about to publish this, this beautiful paper where they were actually doing exactly what we wanted. They had developed an automated phenotyping strategy to classify these two different types of hearing loss. Um, so essentially what they did, this is, this is really elegant and beautiful work. I, I recommend reading this paper, but um, just briefly what they did is they, they used uh, data from gerbils and human populations to essentially create these um, shapes of audiograms that are representative of what I'm going to term, well, what they termed and what I'll refer to in the rest of the, the presentation as sensory hearing loss. So this is this is this hearing loss that I referred to where you have this very steep sloping curve. Um, and then the second uh, audiogram shape that they they found was for metabolic hearing loss, which is more sort of consistent with uh, age-related hearing loss. So once they had these um, shapes that are representative of the two um, types of hearing loss, what they then went on to do is 
look at whether you can use this information to quantify the amount of these types of hearing loss in individuals using audiogram data. So just to, to briefly explain this, if you think of this as an individual's audiogram, what you'll do is you'll see, you'll, you'll kind of think of it as a puzzle where you'll see how many of these metabolic hearing loss shapes fit into this audiogram and how many of the sensory hearing loss shapes fit into the audiogram. So what you'll get at the end of the day for each individual is a measure of how much of these two hearing loss phenotypes you see in each individual. So this, this is a really smart way of doing this. Um, so we applied this approach in the Canadian Longitudinal Study of Aging, which is, it's, it's really an amazing resource because we do have both these audiogram data and the genetic data and clinical information that we need. Uh, so what Samar did is she took these data and for each individual where there was appropriate data, she, she obtained a measure of metabolic hearing loss as well as a me measure of sensory hearing loss. Um, we could then combine this data with uh, the genotype data, or the information on genetic variants in the CLSA. So there are around 300 million genetic variants, which we can use in our analyses. Um, and I also just wanted to note that it's just amazing to see how the CLSA project uh, creates these resources that other people can use. So, um, the study uh, was published a couple of years back where they actually did all the quality control steps that are important in these kind of studies. And the study is available so you can apply it to your uh, studies as well, which which definitely streams, streamlines things because sometimes these quality control processes take a while. Um, so just to note, in addition to the data that's already available uh, through the CLSA, we're currently in the process of um, expanding this data and essentially adding information on um, more complex genetic variants that aren't captured currently. So these are things like um, short tandem repeats where there are two to six base pairs of DNA that uh, are expanded a number of different times in individuals. And th these types of variants have been shown to be important in aging phenotypes. So. Um, we hope to also release these data soon so that other people can can use this information in their studies too. Um, and that that that's been made possible by a CLSA catalyst grant um, that we received. So yeah, a huge thanks for that. Um, so yeah, so we have we have these hearing loss phenotypes, we've got the genotype information, and then we also included some information on known demographic and clinical variables with, that we know contribute to these uh, specific phenotypes because they are complex. They're not just solely genetics. There's, there's definitely an interaction between different variables. Um, so having this information, the first thing we went to do is we looked at, um, like I mentioned before, we looked at genetic variants that are observed at a higher frequency in these two hearing loss phenotypes. Um, and importantly, what we also included in these analyses, which uh, many people do not because it's a little bit more technically challenging, is the um, X chromosome where you have two X chromosomes in women and an X and a Y in, in males. So it, it complicates analyses a little, but I, I think it's an important thing that should be included in genome-wide association studies. Um, so, so when we looked at these, the results of these analyses, um, we found that there were different genetic variants that were associated in metabolic hearing loss compared to the genetic variants that were associated with sensory hearing loss. Um, so at the beginning of the presentation, I showed you this plot where I explained you have these these dots which represent genetic variants across the genome and their association with your phenotype. Um, so those plots are called uh, Manhattan plots because they sort of you expect to see these high-rise buildings coming up. Um, this plot over here is called a Miami plot because you see on the top you see the results for the metabolic phenotype, and on the bottom you see the results for the sensory phenotype. So it's like 
reflections in the water essentially is why it's, why it's called a Miami plot. Um, so, so looking at these findings a little closer, what we saw is that for the metabolic phenotype shown in blue, we saw that there was an association with a spe specific genetic variant in ARHGF28, which if you have a good memory, you'll remember that was the, the one that we saw in the, the self-reported hearing loss uh, Manhattan plot too. However, what's interesting about this is that we see this peak coming up quite strongly for the, the metabolic phenotype, but we, we don't really see that same thing coming up in the sensory phenotype. So it looks like that variant is a little bit more important to metabolic hearing loss when compared to sensory hearing loss. Um, what's also nice about this, um, I've, I've done a couple of genome-wide association studies in the past where you you find this genetic variant and it's just in the middle of nowhere. There's no gene close to it. It's, it's really hard to know why it's important. Um, but what's nice about this is actually the most significantly associated variant is a variant that changes the protein sequence of a specific uh, protein. So it's, it, we kind of have an effect for it, which is really nice. Um, so the other finding that came up specifically with the metabolic hearing loss was um, a genetic variant on the X chromosome, which there, there have been studies that have looked at the role of the X chromosome in self-reported hearing loss and have sort of indicated that it's it's not not that important, but it is interesting to see that we do have one of our significant findings coming up here. Um, this one we're not so lucky with, it is uh, downstream from a pseudogene, so a, a gene that doesn't, isn't a protein coding gene. So it's uh, a little more complicated to know what the, the effect of this variant is. So we're, we're doing a lot more uh, fine mapping analyses to try and understand what is the function of this variant. Um, but you also see that this, this isn't coming up in the sensory phenotype. Um, when we look specifically at the sensory phenotype in red, uh, we see that there is a genetic variant coming up in the sensory uh, uh, sensory phenotype, but not the metabolic. Um, it looks like potentially there's a there's a signal coming up. Interestingly, this is actually a different signal, which is coming up in both, just slightly to the left. Um, but once again, this unique signal that we are finding for the sensory hearing loss phenotype has been previously reported to be associated with self-reported uh, hearing loss, but it's the first time that we're showing that maybe there's a more specific effect for sensory hearing loss. Um, so building on these analyses a little more, we then wanted to perform gene-based analyses. So trying to see if we, combine the effects of genetic variants that all occur within a specific region or a specific gene, do we see anything different in our association results? Um, so once again, we do see uh, that there are differences between the metabolic hearing loss phenotype and the sensory hearing loss phenotype. Um, these gene-based analyses identify the same two genes that were previously found, so ARHDF28 and KLHDC7B. Um, but they also uncovered, so, so we got a little bit more power through these analyses, and they also uncovered uh, two additional genes in the metabolic phenotype and three additional genes in the sensory phenotype. Um, so when we zoom in specifically on the metabolic phenotype, what we saw is that um, in addition to the gene that we found in the variant-based analyses, an additional two genes came up, FUS and IPO7. Um, so when we looked at this in a little bit more detail, we found it was quite interesting to see that all three of these genes have been implicated in ALS frontotemporal dementia. Um, so we know that um, FUS mislocalization is observed in ALS FTD, 
And there's, there's also been reports that IPO7 may be involved in this, this FUS mislocalization. Um, also, we know that ARGF28 has been implicated in the formation of neurofilament aggregates in ALS FTD. Um, so it, it was really interesting for us to see this, this connection between these genes and these uh, dementia-related phenotypes. Um, this is particularly interesting because um, hearing loss has been reported to be one of the largest modifiable risk factors for dementia. Um, and actually, uh, oh, this is the wrong, oh, sorry, <laughs> uh, this, this reference over here, um, recently this year, actually, there was a publication from the CLSA where they, they quantified these modifiable risk factors. And you can see over here, um, hearing loss is one of the greatest midlife risk factors for or modifiable risk factors for dementia. So, so we think these findings are really interesting. Um, and because of this, uh, one of the recent graduate students in my, my lab, Andy van Dommelen, um, also a fantastic student, um, is currently investigating whether there are sort of shared genetic architecture or mechanisms between specifically metabolic hearing loss and dementia. Um, and yeah, we, we hope to see some interesting things in this in the future, also working with other groups um, and looking at this in, in slightly different ways too. Um, so yeah, I, I, I spoke about the, um, the association between genes and metabolic hearing loss, but if we look at the sensory hearing loss phenotype in red, um, we see, I, I mentioned this, this gene we've already talked about, but there are another three genes, um, that are coming up. And two of these are very, very close to each other. So it's likely that it's it's probably just one signal that we're seeing, and it's only really one of those genes that are contributing. Um, but when we look at this, it's actually, it's, it's really interesting because the two genes that are coming up have been associated with Mendelian deafness. So what we see is if you have, um, both of these, uh, you have genetic variants in both copies of these genes that result in a non-functional protein product, you will see a phenotype that is uh, essentially inherited deafness. However, what we're seeing in, in our uh, sensory hearing loss phenotype is that we, we also see, we see genetic variants in these genes that are associated but it looks like the impact of those variants are not quite as del deleterious on the, the protein function. So for example, for Myo15A, we're actually still seeing genetic variants that change the protein sequence of this, this protein, but the effect of those changes seems to be a little less than what we see in inherited deaf, Mende or Mendelian deafness. Um, so it's possible that these slight changes in combination with environmental factors like exposure to noise eventually result in a phenotype that is observed as hearing loss in older adults. Um, so, so yeah, that, that, that's really interesting for us. Um, we, we were really interested to see these, these differences that coming up between metabolic and sensory uh, hearing loss, but what we, also wanted to do is see if there are potential sex differences. Um, so one of the reasons for this is because we know that there are differences in the prevalence of hearing loss between males and females. Um, so for example, we see this sensory related phenotype um, occurs more frequently in males compared to females. Um, of course, this may be due to differences uh, traditionally in occupations, so potentially males may have been exposed to more noise, um, resulting in a higher prevalence of this phenotype. But we also wanted to do due diligence and see are there potential differences in the genetic pathways underlying these phenotypes in males and females. Um, so when we looked at the metabolic or sort of more typical uh, age-related phenotype, we, we didn't see any significant differences between males and females. Um, however, when we looked at the sensory phenotype, um, 
we saw two differences that were, were quite interesting to us. Um, so the first difference that we observed was once again, this, uh, this gene that I've, uh, has come up a couple of times in our analyses. Um, once again, we see an association between variants in this gene and uh, sensory hearing loss, but we only really see this association in the females. Um, and so uh, Sama went and looked in more detail about this gene, and she found interestingly uh, when she looked at data from the International Mouse Phenotype Consortium, um, what she saw was that there was um, abnormal hearing morphology uh, that's observed in female mice with this with mutations in this gene, but the, this this phenotype wasn't really seen in. Males. So this this is definitely interesting for us. It's it's similar to what we see in our human study, our human analyses, where we see that these genetic variants are seem to be. Uh, and also, I, I forgot to mention the genetic variant that came up in this gene also resulted in a change in the coding sequence of the protein. Um. So it seems like if you have these mutations in females it's more likely to increase your risk of hearing loss compared to males. Um, the other interesting finding that came um, up in these sex stratified analyses is that we actually uncovered a completely new gene that was associated with sensory hearing loss in males only. So this gene had not come up previously. We didn't see it in any of our studies. And I think part of the reason for this is that there's no association with this variant in females, but a fairly strong one in males. So when you you com just combine those two groups of individuals together, um, you won't see that association. Whereas when you look at them separately, we see that actually a pretty strong um, association in males. Um, so th this is an interesting gene for hearing. Um, there are reports that um, this gene plays an important role in in ear development in mice. Um, of course, we're looking more at the aging phenotype, so I think that there's more research that needs to be done to see how mutations in this gene impact an aging phenotype in comparison to a development phenotype. But it, it's still encouraging to see that. It is important in the inner ear, and um, we've also there's also the same study showed that if you knock out this gene specifically in the the inner ear, you do see changes in um, uh, specific things in the inner ear, like hair cells. Um, what's also interesting is in a separate study um, that looked at differences in gene expression between um, males and females as they age. What they saw is that um, this, this expression of this specific gene increased in aged females, but n did not increase at the same in the same way in males. And I think there were only three genes that they found that showed this pattern. So it's it's quite an interesting finding. And also interesting to see that maybe this increased expression in females protects them against mutations that affect the functioning of the gene, uh, especially if these, again, this is another variant, we're still trying to understand how it impacts gene function, but if we can see something like a decrease in the expression of this gene associated with this variant, this may help to really fill in the gaps in the picture of our understanding of, of these variants. Um, yeah, so I, I think this is, this has been an overview of the the work we've been doing, looking at the genetics of age related phenotypes, um, and this has been purely looking at human uh, genetic data. But one of the things that I think we still need a little bit more information on, and that there's lots of work being done by various different groups, um, but we really need to try and understand. The cellular origins and the cell specific processes of these age related hearing loss phenotypes. Um, so it's, it's, uh, 
so exciting that there have been these technologies that have uh, been developed recently where you can actually look at gene expression in single cells, um, which is really exciting for uh, inner ear research because some of these really, really important cells, they occur, uh, they only make up like 3% of the entire cells that we look at. And so previously we haven't really been able to get a good understanding of how gene expression changes in these very specific cells. But now with these, these new technologies, we can really gain greater insights into this. Um, and I also just wanted to uh, make a quick shout out to uh, Diana Ximiao in my lab, who's also a PhD student, who's really been setting up these technologies uh, in collaboration with the Len Dubdahl's group. Um, and yeah, we're, we're excited to see where this, this leads. Um, and we've also just set up a, a single cell uh, sequencing suite and some of these equipment, uh, not only can we look at the, the single cell level, we can actually um, look at the spatial level so we can see cells next to each other, how are these, these gene expression patterns impacting uh, each other. So say you see a, a change in one cell, does that lead to a change in the surrounding cells? So um, it's, a, it's a really exciting space. And I think by combining these uh, single cell gene expression data with human uh, genetic information from these genome-wide association studies, we can really get a better insight into the specific genes and cells that are important to these phenotypes. Um, so yeah, just in summary, um, our, our study has confirmed the heterogeneous nature of age-related uh, hearing loss. Um, that this has been known before, but I think just reiterating this is always important to consider, in, especially in these large-scale genetic studies. Um, and what's interesting is we have uncovered specific genetic pathways that seem to be more important to uh, certain hearing phenotypes in comparison to others. And also importantly, I think this is important to consider in future studies. We've, we've shown the, the role of the X chromosome and we've also shown striking sex-specific differences. Um, so, so this is adding to the growing body of literature where we're improving our understanding of the genetics underlying distinct hearing loss phenotypes. Um, and hopefully this will open up future research aimed at early diagnoses for these phenotypes. And if we can improve our understanding of the, the pathways involved, hopefully also uh, results in more precise treatments and better treatments, as well as management strategies. Um, so yeah, in closing, I, I owe a big thanks, not only to the people in my lab, who've really specifically Sama Ahmed, who's been leading the analyses that I've been talking about, um, but also the the collaborators, um, Judy Dubno and Ke Kenneth Vaden, uh, Without their beautiful phenotyping approaches, uh, we wouldn't have this data. And yeah, future studies too. I think we've got lots of collaborators that that will be important to the future. So yeah, thank you. Thank you for listening. Well, thank you. I think uh, lots of information, definitely a new area for for myself. Um, I'd like to turn it over to uh, to the Q and A session now. We already have a few listed, so what I will do is I'll go through those and you can answer them. Also, just a reminder that um, everyone will remain on mute, but you can enter your questions into the, the Q&A box, um, which is at the bottom of your screen. So the first question, um, which came in right away, are, are there any foods which could improve one's odds of retaining one's hearing? How about supplements? I've heard selenium can, can help, such as Brazil, or which is present in Brazil nuts. Yeah, that's that's a really interesting question. Um, my lab hasn't personally been looking at that, so we've been focused more on um understanding the genetic pathways involved in, in hearing. But one of the things we are interested in looking at is if we can see that there are really um interesting tools that you can use where you can compare pathways that you see are associated with hearing loss phenotypes to pathways that are changed by small molecules or even types of foods or, or compounds in foods and 
by comparing these two things, we hope that we can identify treatments that could help with these hearing loss phenotypes. Um, probably it won't be a, a complete solution, but if we can at least identify things that might counter some of the harmful effects of these very subtle genetic changes, I think that would be a really interesting area of future research. Um, yeah, unfortunately, I, I can't comment too much on the, the food types that are already known, but yeah, it's a, it's a great question. Okay, so now to Louise, if we can identify genetic variants that cause hearing loss, could we research ways to ameliorate these uh, treatment or other strategies? Yeah, also a great question. So, so one of the things, one of the, there's also interest, there's so many tools that are being developed these days, but there is actually a tool that you can use to um, investigate the drug ability of specific genes that are identified. So actually the, the two genes that kept popping up in our studies that were associated with um, uh, the two phenotypes, we've looked at the drug ability of these genes and they actually look like they're fairly good drug targets. So this is definitely something if you can identify a gene that you know, say, for example, decreased expression or decreased function of that gene um, increases your risk for hearing loss, you can think of that that gene as a drug target and hopefully develop strategies. So I mean, it, it's not something we've, we've started looking at yet, but I, I think it's definitely an area of interest. Hopefully the next one is is quick and you know is, is tinnitus genetic? Yeah, that's a great question. That we we've actually there was a recent study that came out. Um, I think it was last year where they looked at the genetics of tinnitus and yeah, they they are finding genetic variants that are associated. Um, and they also seem to be distinct from the ones that are coming up in these phenotypes. So I I think. Um, it's it's not simple, but it, it does look like there is an important role partially for genetics. I wouldn't say genetics accounts for everything, but it does increase or decrease your risk uh, for diverse hearing phenotypes, and that includes tinnitus. Okay, then the question, we still have a few more. Uh, to what extent are the genes associated with metabolic hearing loss also associated with other, other metabolic conditions? That's a great question. We haven't, these, these findings are fairly new, so we haven't looked into that yet. But I, I think um, one thing we'd be interested in looking at in the future is potentially looking at the genetic correlation between related phenotypes. So um, obviously I mentioned looking at the correlation between uh, cognitive traits and hearing loss, but, but maybe expanding that, that further would be very interesting. Um, all right, so moving on to the next one. What impact do tinnitus or other auditory disturbances have related to hearing loss? And are these being included in your study? Yeah, so we did not include anything beyond the two phenotypes we looked at. So we saw that there was quite a strong effect of, say, if you have metabolic hearing loss, there is a strong effect on uh, sensory hearing loss. So that these, it's not like these are completely distinct phenotypes. They do influence each other. And I would imagine the same would apply for other phenotypes. Um, we're starting to look at things like um, hidden hearing loss and trying to to understand how that fits into to, uh, these phenotypes too. But I, I think it's, it's complex. It's, I think the way I presented it sort of gave us simplified version of things. And I think all of these these phenotypes are related to each other and influence each other too. So it's a great question. Okay. Um, so the next one is a little bit more general, um, asking for your comments on recent reports about the hearing development of infants who are exposed to white noise machines in their bedroom. I'd be very curious about this too. <laughs> I, I'll be honest, I don't know too much about this. Um, I, I, I wish I did have a, an answer for that. I, I haven't looked into that at all. Um, I, I'm not sure. <laughs> I would love to hear if anyone else has opinions, but yeah. Fair enough. Not everybody, uh, different areas of research for different uh, investigators, so fair mm -hmm. enough. 
Um, okay, so next one is a complimentary fantastic work. How often do both processes, the metabolic and sensory, co-occur? And how is that handled at the stage of strict of trait classification from your audio audio rooms? Yes, again, a great question. So that they, they occur often together. So so what we have done is we have taken them as separate phenotypes. So for each individual, we have an estimate for the amount of metabolic hearing loss. And we look only at the association between that and genetic variants, and then the same for sensory. But because the two phenotypes are correlated, what we've done is we've included the opposite phenotype as a covariate in those analyses. So, so essentially we do two separate genome-wide association studies for each phenotype. Um, but including the opposite phenotype as a covariate. Great. Um, okay, is uh, pulsatile tinnitus considered to be a hearing loss or do I just try to live with it? Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a difficult question. Um, I mean, it, it is a hearing phenotype. Um, I, I, my lab doesn't look a lot at tinnitus, so I, I don't have a good answer, but I, I think for sure we need to develop strategies to, to develop more precise management strategies for different phenotypes. And I think that's part of the message we're, we're trying to relay here is that we, we need to have more precise, more personalized measures and treatments for different phenotypes across the spectrum. And does hearing loss progress with aging? What's your feedback? Yeah, ab absolutely. We we see um it's it's interesting. We looked at well, Samar looked at the the if you look across the ages at metabolic estimates, we see that there's a definite correlation between aging and voice metabolic hearing loss. Interestingly, we, we don't see as much of an association between the sensory phenotype, um, which I guess is to be expected because this is more related to noise exposure and autotoxic drugs. So we for sure see that age effect in the metabolic phenotype. And while we see a slight increase, uh, likely just because as you ex live for longer, you're exposed to more things, it's it's definitely not as pronounced. Um, and so we also, we included age as a covariate in our analyses, and we're thinking of doing things like um, models where we consider age and maybe different genetic predictors at different age groups. Uh, and Meniere's disease, did you focus on or look at this at all in your research? We didn't know it, but it's also an area that would be interesting to look at specifically overlap in... in uh, you're getting yeah. lots of good ideas today, then. Yeah, know. for sure. Um, and uh, going back to the one of the questions uh, that Bastian Ryu uh, for, uh, asked, he also wants to know if were the analyses run on European ancestry participants or across ancestry. Yeah, that's also a great question. So um, we did both. Um, the results were fairly similar, but I, I, unfortunately, the representation of non-European populations um, is obviously not as, as it is for European uh, ancestry populations. Um, what we're trying to do to make sure that our analyses are more applicable across global populations is we're, we're really trying to uh, find the exact causal variance. So if we, if we create things like um, genetic risk models, we don't want to include just a variant that's linked to those variants. We want to try and include the actual causal variant so that hopefully these predictive models will be more likely to be applicable across, across global populations. Um, and there, there has been shown to be some success with using these approaches rather than traditional ones. Um, and I think this will be our last question, but we do have a couple of minutes if anybody wants to squeeze one in. Um, and I definitely don't think it's a poor question because it actually is interesting, but are there mm -hmm. treatments for hearing problems besides hearing aids? Yeah, so so there, there are other options. I, th I think hearing aids are probably the most commonly used, but there are things like cochlear implants, um, 
I think there's also things that are important to consider is strategies to manage hearing loss, making sure um, things are accessible and easy. Um, so yeah, I, th I think I think it's a growing area of research. Um, I saw the Apple AirPods to are um, actually trying to integrate um, sort of a hearing aid component into their their new uh, AirPods. So I think I think that's an interesting, potentially cheaper and more accessible option. Um, it'll be interesting to see how it works. But I think for sure it's a it's a developing area. So that looks like all the questions that are in the Q and A. So maybe we'll uh, go on to close. I'm sure if you had any, if anybody has any questions, you could follow up directly by email with Dr. Drogmuller. Um, uh, okay. So I'd like to now remind everyone that the next deadline for data app access applications, if you're interested in looking at CLSA data, is October second. Um, so you can visit the CLSA website under data access to review what data is available, as well as additional details about the application process. I'd also uh, like to remind everyone that um, to complete their anonymous survey uh, following the Zoom session today, that will give us uh, some information to plan future webinars. Um, and our next webinar, if you're interested in attending, is entitled Potentially Modifiable Risk Factors for Low Cognition and Dementia. Could Canada Reduce Dementia by 50%? Um, and it will be presented on Thursday, October 24th by a PhD candidate by the name of Surim Sun um, and Dr. Manuel Montero Odasso and Dr. Mark Speechley, all from the University of Western Ontario. And you can find registration details on our website under the webinars tab. Um, and then finally, just like to always remind everyone that the CLSA promotes the webinar series using the hashtag CLSA webinar. And you can follow up, follow us on uh, Twitter or X at, at CLC, CLSA underscore ELCB. Have a great afternoon, everyone. And uh, we'll see you at the next webinar.